Hi there, my name is Shane Isaac and I'm the CEO and founder of Earth2. So I'm here today to talk about one of the new game mechanic systems we are building for the Earth2 community. The very first iteration of what we refer to as raiding. This talk will also include details about droids as droids and raiding are inherently linked to one another. If you're new to Earth 2 or you've only heard information from unofficial sources and find Earth 2 intriguing, I highly suggest spending a few minutes of your valuable time to watch this video. Additionally, if game design interests you, then feel free to provide your own thoughts or feedback below, as there are often different perspectives and approaches to solving the same problem and we'd love to hear any constructive ideas or suggestions you might have. In follow-up videos, I will also touch base on two of our other work-in-progress game mechanic systems, which are civilians and player-to-player -player contracts. Hopefully, this will allow anyone interested to understand these four initial game mechanics, which is raiding, droids, civilians, and player-to-player -player contracts, and how they fit together to provide an interesting and engaging experience on our website as we slowly build toward the release of our one-to-one -one scale digital 3D world we often to refer to as E2v1. As many of you know, we are building a massive open world metaverse platform. And to me personally, when I think metaverse, I also think of gamified experiences amongst many other things. So the initial four game mechanics I have referenced serve as an initial light introduction that will represent probably a fraction of the future game mechanics we have planned for Earth 2. So by no means should these game mechanics be interpreted as this is all the Earth 2 metaverse is going to be or this defines the Earth 2 metaverse indefinitely. What I am going to talk about today is just the next step on our journey to building this geolocational metaverse, focusing more on some of the gamification elements and not things like the economic simulator, building, creating experiences, internal environments, customization, uh, delivering 3D commercial and retail solutions, trading systems, and other things like that. So, these are many of the other long-term goals we have for Earth 2, but they won't be included in this specific talk. So now that's clear, let's jump in. The game mechanics for my rating concept solve six short-term problems for us and for Earth 2. Number one, rating provides active Earth 2 players with something more hands-on to do during the waiting period as we lead into the next phase features of the ecosim, such as resource generation, trading and building, and, and the future release of our 3D world, E2v1. So basically it gives players something to do in the interim. Number two, rating also brings the opportunity for potential reward to those players who are active on our platform, something I am very much proactive about and I believe strongly in, the rewarding of players who support and believe in the long-term goal of Earth 2. We've seen this time and time again with recent feature releases and that will continue in the, in the near future. The third benefit of raiding is that it allows us to design and implement key game mechanics via our current web page interface. But these are mechanics that also are relevant for E2v1 in the future. So we're building systems and game mechanics now that will have long-term relevance to our platform. For number four, rating also provides us with an opportunity to build and test our new back-end game engine. I'm not talking about the visual game engine, I'm talking about the mechanics, the crux, the calculations that are happening in the background. This engine will inevitably also be used inside of E2v1 for a multitude of reasons, such as uh, pinpoint tracking of mu moving vehicles inside our massive world, power storage uh, and drain, calculating roaming ranges, and much more that will become evident throughout this video and upcoming videos. So for example, whether we had a droid traveling from West End into Hyde Park or traveling from London to Paris, this backend system that we're building will be able to tell us real time where that droid is and not only where that droid is, but millions of other droids at the same time, all in real time. 
The fifth benefit of rating is that it provides a light introduction to behaviors, processes, flows, and core mechanics and ideologies we will see long term inside of Earth 2, and particularly the ecosystem. And finally, number six, and quite possibly most importantly, rating adds more core utility to the existing digital items you can earn today by owning land inside of Earth 2, such as direct utility for Ether, new utility for Essence and Jewels, and the introduction of new digital items with new utilities such as droids. In this particular video, I'll cover the details about rating and droids, as I know many in our community are curious about how this will work and wanted to understand details about these mechanics in advance. So before we release it. So today, I'm not only going to talk about that, but we'll also walk you guys through some of the actual UI designs, as pictures can often paint a thousand words. And I believe those designs also provide a little insight into some of the problems we had to solve and how we approach solving those problems. Before I jump into that, I'll quickly cover a little background on virtual land inside of Earth 2. So from day one, my core short and long-term goals have always been to add purpose and utility to land inside of Earth 2 over time, rewarding and providing opportunities to those who own land so that almost anything that happens inside of Earth 2 is linked back to land somehow. I wanted to create this virtual world in which almost everything built somehow comes from utilizing or toiling player on land in one way, shape or form. So much like the real world, inside of Earth 2, almost everything stems from player owned land. This approach has already been demonstrated on Earth 2, as we've seen it gradually come into play during our platform's brief two year history. For a new player buying new land today, they can purchase the land, then build a free mentor, which is then able to detect ether evaporation, which generally happens over 48 hour cycles. After detected, this ether can then be collected by the player via the mentor and is either stored as ether or optionally transferred from ether into essence. Essence being the core long-term digital commodity that will have extensive utility inside of the Earth2 platform. Different types of land can also spawn jewels, which are collectible by the players and tradable on one of our internal player-to-player -player marketplaces named the Bazaar. Just to make it clear, players don't buy the jewels from Earth 2, they collect them. There's been over 2 million US dollars worth of trade between players already today, just with jewels alone, which we consider as, a, as one of our minor digital commodities. To date, Essence also has some limited utility, being used in the process of crafting special types of jewels, and more recently for staking during the resource validation opportunity. Jewels also have some current utility as well to increase ether detection on player owned land and in the near future significant utility for resource production inside of the ecosystem. That is, in addition to the rating concept which will also inevitably add more utility to ether, essence and jewels and all the above. We are definitely committed to a long term goal to adding an increasing amount of utility to essence and all other types of digital commodities inside of Earth 2. I won't jump down the rabbit hole of Earth 2's ideologies, such as putting more focus and benefit onto the player with giving them control of selling or trading digital items they own on the Earth2 platform. It's clear we want to share in the success with our players on the Earth2 platform while also providing them an experience. Unlike other platforms which sell digital items or digital goods to their player base without that support or ability to trade for real money between the players. So I'm saying if you buy a skin on another game, you own that skin, you can use that skin, but you can't sell it to another player. Earth 2's ideology is very much against that. We want players to be able to trade it between other players indefinitely. So now, let's take a closer look at what rating and droids are, and then we will walk through some of the planned UI UX you will see go live on the website, hopefully in the next few weeks. This is very much still a work in progress, as much like anything inside of Earth 2. We're constantly reviewing, balancing, and altering things where necessary. So what you will see today will be a very close representation of what goes live on our website, but there may be small changes, especially to any figures you see of how much something might cost or how much energy it might use and so forth. So please be careful to bear this in mind when you watch this video. So let's look at what droids are and let's look at a little bit of the background 
mixed with the law, so to speak. As new and popular cultures, beliefs and factions emerge within the metaverse, concentrated mental energies generated from these groups fuse together to form what we call metasprites. Metasprites are the incorporeal states of the droids, loyal to their origin, factions, culture, and roam free through the Earth 2 metaverse as ethereal beings. A mixture of civilizations living within a close proximity may inadvertently place intense pressure on a metasprite once it forms, so that once it begins to take shape as a droid, it defects and has no connection or allegiance to any faction whatsoever preferring to spend its time as a solo, neutral droid. Ethereal droids inexplicably have a deep and powerful connection with Mentars. They also speak to each other in some otherworldly way, and roam around the metaverse seeking new Mentars to explore. Despite its desire to roam, it is not unusual for a meta sprite to be captured quite close to where it was formed, though many are still able to traverse within the metaverse in many different ways. It is discovered that, with the use of essence, these ethereal droid forms can be hacked and captured to reveal their binary composition data. With this vital data available, the energized essence and mentor learns how to work together to fuse and amalgamate the essence into an actual physical droid. As soon as the droid is created, it is automatically tethered to the mentor, with which it shares a special kind of bond. However, unaccustomed to the new body, droids need to be powered using powered cells in order to utilize their physical form when being relocated or sent out on what we will learn about raids. Power cells are created using essence and they can only be charged while the droid is tethered to a mentor. When first created, most droids will only be able to hold a certain amount of ether, travel at a certain set speed, relocate a certain distance and consume their power cell energy at a certain rate. However, the powerful spiritual presence of jewels can hack into the metacode of the droid and recode certain droid functions and abilities such as speed, storage and so forth. A droid can only be relocated among the same network of mentors as these mentors create a special connection between them to boost the travel capability so that the droid can travel very far distances over neighboring lands. When droids are sold, which is something that will come at a later stage, a very special temporary connection between the two mentors will appear, allowing the droid to be transferred. Once the droid arrives at the new mentor, they will have to go through a tethering process where they are recoded to assimilate into the new environment and form a new relationship with that new mentor. Droids are very useful to their owners and can be sent to raid neighboring properties of any uncollected ether. Built from a fusion of Metasprite, Essence and Mentar energy, only droids have the power to hack into unsecured Mentars and deliver the uncollected leftover ether back to the owner. Since a droid is distanced from its own mentor when raiding, it will use significant energy to venture onto enemy land in order to capture that precious ether for its owner. However, droids are very loyal to their mentors, and when sent on raids, they will wait up to hours, despite the power drain meticulously scanning the entire property for a chance to discover and retrieve some of that ether. ether evaporates from tiles of player-owned land all over the earth and can be detected by mentars. Detected ether will vanish after about 48 hours, but due to the slightly unstable nature of ether, the mentor cannot secure the ether for the last 24 hours. Whilst the ether is unsecured, surrounding properties can send droids to raid ether from that mentor, which can detect the unsecured ether on that actual mentor. Droids will follow the direct orders of their owners and are completely dependent on their owners' strategies to help them maximize their opportunities at raiding ether. There can be multiple droids at a mentor at any given time, 
and each of those droids on the raid will have an equal chance of obtaining ether at the time it's unsecured. However, some droids may miss out if the competition is too high, especially for droids raiding from large properties where a large quantity of ether is released that would attract more participants trying to raid the property. So as a quick summary, droids and raiding are all built around player-owned land. Ether is available for any player to collect on their property for generally a 48 hour period. A player's mentor will keep that ether stable for around about 24 hours. After that 24 hour period, it becomes unstable and other players are able to send their droids to raid that property during that period of time. This gives every player a 24 hour period to claim their ether. If they don't, it becomes open market. This will become more difficult over time, but in the beginning, it will be quite simple. Every player will be able to defend against this by claiming their ether within the first 24 hour period. From internal statistics, we understand that there is going to be a lot of different ether available at different times, and there will be a lot of different strategies that players explore to find where that available ether is. If they find a nice inactive property, do they share that with others or do they keep it to themselves? So that's a brief introduction to raiding and droids. Now, there are a lot of different strategies that will come out of this. To understand how detailed this game mechanics actually is, let's look at some of the UI and walk through it. I'll try and give some notes and comments as we progress. Everything together opens up an interesting amount of strategies that players will probably learn a little bit now about as we go through the UI but definitely when they get their hands on the actual game mechanics on the website, you'll start to understand that there are a lot of different strategies and things to consider in order to be able to gain ether and transform it into essence by using droids and raiding. The entire game mechanic system for raiding and droids will migrate into E2v1, so much so that the droids that you build now already function and work inside of E2v1. So if you build a droid now, you will see the actual 3D model that will be flyable and representable inside of the 3D E2v1 world. So this truly is a stepping stone between website gameplay and E2v1 gameplay. Now, for those of you who are interested, I'll walk through some of the UI and I'll provide some feedback and thoughts on different things as we progress. So what we're just about to jump in and have a look at in the UI will let you understand how much work and effort has gone into just delivering this, this initial rating Android game mechanic. A lot of it is focused on functionality. So a lot of what you're going to see will migrate into E2v1 in the future from a functionality perspective, but what this web version doesn't include is like things like the bells and whistles so if you build a droid we're not going to have animated kind of scenes and and if you send your droid on a raid we're not going to have all of that animated yet or or in 3d we'll be focusing on delivering that type of experience inside of e2v1 so instead of us wasting time implementing that system in the web browser I'd prefer our team to focus on delivering that inside of E2v1. And you know, maybe the video you guys see later this month will give you a bit of an indication of how it might look and feel inside E2v1. So what we're looking at right now is a mock-up. Our front-end team have been focused on implementing these designs and these designs are slowly getting synced with a lot of the back-end development. So I'm going to be using this mock-up as a guideline to give you guys an insight into what you will expect when the, when the rating and droid game mechanic systems come online. So the first new thing that you'll notice is this raid button. Players will be able to press on this raid button to open up a list of, the, of their properties. So obviously you'll need to own a property with a mentor on it and have droids built or 
or tethered to that property in order to initiate a raid. You'll notice a button here called the Droid Management button. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's a, an entire different section in itself. Dispense All will show you how many of your droids are sitting on your property with ether in their storage compartments, ready to dispense the ether back into your Mentars and then back into your balance. You might notice that some of these borders have different colors. Now, this color scheme is related to the upcoming player-to-player -player contract system. So I won't talk about that now. I'm just mentioning for those of you who might be curious as to why it's there, that's, that's its purpose. It's to differentiate which properties are under your control as the owner, which properties are under the control of another player even though you own that property. And it, it, it helps you differentiate between, between the group. And you might also see properties here that you're in control which belong to other players. So I won't go into the detail now because that's all related to the player to player contract system and let's push forward. When you click on a property, you'll be able to see some of the property stats here. Things like how many droids you have dispensing ether at that, at that time. How many droids are full? So how many droids are full of ether and waiting to be dispensed? How many droids you're building on your property at that time? how many droids you have tethered to your property. Because remember, your Mentars set up a network around the world. And depending how far away you, the closest Mentar is, you can relocate your droids to another property. There are restrictions on this, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. You'll be able to see how many of your droids are out raiding at any given time. You'll be able to see how many droids are idle, so doing nothing, they're just sitting there not being used. And you'll be able to see how many droids are depowered. Now, droids that have been depowered just means they don't have any power in them to function at that time. So each of these have their own internal drop-down lists. Here you can see details about the droids that are dispensing. So you can see the droid name, you can see how much ether it's dispensing, and you can see how long that's going to take. When droids dispense ether, and this is ether that you've successfully raided and collected from other properties, it takes, it takes some period of time. You can also see how many droids are full. So you can see the droid name and how many are actually full. In this case, we're just showing two droids that are not yet full. You can also see the droids being built, including the time that droid will have finished building. You can see the droids tethering to your property. So again, the tethering process is allowing the droid to learn the lay of the land and make sure that it has the right calculations to be able to, to find the ether on any adjoining properties or within a certain vicinity. You can also see droids that are raiding. So in this case, we have three droids out raiding. You've got the droid name, you can see what it's doing. It's waiting for ether detection. You can see the, the property details of the, the, the property that that droid is raiding. In the next droid down here, you can see that this droid is traveling to the raid location. In the third example here, you can see that it's returning to your base. We covered idle droids earlier and the depowered droids have also been explained. In order for droids to function, they need charge. So assuming that you've built a droid and you've given it a power cell, you'll need to charge that droid and you'll need to recharge it for different raids. So in this example here, you can see that there's a, there's a notification showing that three of your droids require charge. You can hit that button to charge all three of those droids at the same time. You also have this other option to individually dispense all the ether for a particular property. So in this case, we can see this property has Droids sitting on it with a collective amount of 10 ether, you can tap that to dispense to dispense all. Now, in order for you to start your rating journey, you need to have droids. We have a build option here for you to start building droids on your property. As explained earlier, droids, before they enter the physical state inside of Earth 2, they are meta sprites that are flying around in a spirit ethereal state. Your mentor has the ability to detect and capture that as long as you have the essence to be able to build it. So you use essence to be able to capture that droid, bring it into your mentor or the, the meta sprite droid, droid, bring it into your mentor and then start the building process. Now, once you press build, you'll be able to select how many droids you want to build. 
you'll be able to see the cost of bill. So you'll you, how much essence that's going to cost per droid. And we've got five essence here, but we're still balancing this. It's probably going to be around about two and a half essence. I'll get to it a little bit later, but certain property sizes will be able to host a certain number of droids. So the biggest property size, 750 tiles, will be able to host 10 droids. That will be the maximum. There's a staggering increase between a few tiles up until 750 tiles that allows you to have a different number of droids on your property. At the moment, we're saying the build time for each droid is one day. So we're building three droids. Each of them are going to cost X amount of essence each and the build time is going to be three days. You also have this option to pre-power your droids. So you can build droids that are not powered, so you can just build the physical droids themselves. But before you do anything with the droid, it needs to be powered. So we've just given you this option to pre-power your droids at the same time you build your droid. One of the reasons that we've implemented the system in this way is because player to player contracts in its first iteration will have limited capability for the contracted player to be able to spend the other player's essence so to be able to spend the essence of the owner that will be included in later versions therefore owners are going to have to take the plunge to at least build all the droids on their properties before another player can take over a contract to start operating the property. You can understand why we've done this for now because obviously there is some value in essence and we don't want to kick off the player to player contract with the ability for the contracting player to just go crazy with the essence balance of the owner. The owner is going to have to take the plunge and spend the time to build these droids on each of their properties. Once you've made your selections here, you can start the build. If you've selected the pre-power droids option, it will show you how much essence that is required to power those droids. I've alluded to the fact on a number of occasions that to power things inside of Earth 2, you need essence. Essence is power. In this instance, you need to load Essence into your droids in order to power them and for them to be recharged. Initially, and we're not sure if we're going to change this, it could stay this way, but initially, whatever Essence you put into your droid to give it this charge, you can later take out the exact same amount. So if you, for example, need five Essence to power your droid, you can put that Essence into your droid you can use your droid, you can fly it around, you can get it to do things, you can recharge it continuously through your mentor to reuse it and reuse it. When you depower your droid, your droid just has to be at its full charge before it's depowered and then you can take your five essence back out. So it's just adding utility. It's kind of like staking your essence into the Earth 2 metaverse in order for it to do things and potentially give you some kind of reward. So it's a, it's a massive, massive utility for Essence. Now that's just a very high level of how the energy you know, power cell system would work. And it's probably just good to understand that from this point in time moving forward. Once you decide to build the droids, you'll get another notification pop up just confirming all of the details of how many droids you're building at what location, what the cost is of those droids to be built, uh, how much essence you're using to pre-power those droids if you've decided to pre-power and just a, a, another little disclaimer there. As with many things inside of Earth 2, I like to reward early players, proactive players, people who, who are using the platform and trying out features in their early stages. This process of building droids here is going to be the easy process. Later, after we launch the EcoSim, there are going to be different steps that players are going to have to take to be able to build droids. So this is a unique opportunity for these early players to really have this ability to, to build up some droid armies, so to speak. We still have the narrative there and there still may be certain types of droids that you can, you can capture and bring to your mentor to be constructed. But in the future, you can imagine, especially inside E2v1, you can imagine 
rangers or your avatar running out, running around inside the world and being able to capture these meta sprite droids uh, keep them with you and then take them to a specific building to be able to construct so this as with many things inside of earth 2 is going to start out easy and become more and more difficult over time something else i'd like to just talk about quickly is the the transition or the migration of this game mechanics from the website into e2v1 i know i talk about this a lot however I think it's it's quite cool and quite interesting how we've approached this in the building of droids. So every single type of droid that you can build in the system at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, will be usable inside of E2v1. So in this build process, you won't find out what type of droid you have until the end of the process. So once the droid is built, you'll be able to see which meta sprite your mentor managed to capture and and build. Different types of droids have different types of rarity, so there's different types of chances to build different types of droids from it. As you can see on your screen, here are a few examples. Our team have already designed over 30 of these. Some of the droids you can see might suit different purposes. For now, all the droids will have the same type of functionality, but in the future you might find out that your droid can do something different. But just to be clear, every droid right now serves the same functionality as far as the rating is concerned. Each and every one of these droids have been designed by our team internally. We're not going to show you all of the different types of droids designed so far because we'd like people to find out and discover some of those given the different rarities that are out there. So when you start to build droids you might discover one that nobody's found before and you'll be able to share that and rejoice. And as I mentioned earlier each and every droid is fully compatible inside E2v1. Now, back to the current UI design. Another feature implementation we've added is the relocate option. I talked about that a little bit earlier. It allows players to relocate their droids between their own Mentar properties based on a number of different restrictions. When you press on the relocate button, you'll be able to select the number of droids that you want to relocate. If you're on a specific property, you'll be able to see all the droids on that property, what they're doing, and be able to relocate them. A droid must be idle for it to be relocated. So it's going to give you a list of preference with droids that are idle at the top of that list. Here we start to see some of the statistics for each and every droid. So you'll be able to see how fast the droid can move, You'll be able to see how much ether that droid's carrying. You'll be able to see the charge of the droid, like how much power that droid has internally. You'll be able to see how far that droid can potentially travel based on the, the power that it has and a number of other factors. You'll be able to see how economical that droid is. So the economical sense of the droid is influenced by how the jewels have been slotted onto the droid and some other things. So there are a number of different factors and pieces of data that determine how far a droid can relocate to another property. This also becomes important for the rating aspect, but we'll get to that in a little bit. After I've selected the droid, I'll be able to see which properties are available for relocation. I can see here that I've got a property on Banana Island. Uh, it shows me how many droids are on that property at the moment. Uh, it shows me how many are incoming on that property and how that affects the total number of droids that that property can have. I have a really cool relocation dual setup on this droid. So I can move up to a thousand kilometers for this one then once i hit relocate the droid is going to begin its journey relocating from one property to another property and then tethering to that new mentor before it can be used again to raid properties within that location next we move over to the power option so after you press on power you'll have two options you can look to power droids or depower droids so obviously powering droids is going to provide you with a list of droids on that property that are not powered. 
So if you built the droids and for whatever reason you decided to not to power those droids, or if you had a droid on a property and you depowered it for whatever reasons, your droid is going to show up in this list and this gives you the ability to repower it again. In order to power a droid, I select the number of droids that I want to power. I've got a list here again. I've got all these idle droids. You can see they have no power and no efficiency. They can't do anything because they don't have any power cells inside them. Once I've selected the droids that I want to power, I will have a total provided to me down the bottom here that tells me how much essence is going to be required to power those droids. The other option you have here is to depower your droids. So obviously this is going to provide you with a list of droids on that property that are fully powered and give you the option to depower them. You're not going to be able to select droids that are not 100% charged. So droids need to have a full charge to be able to depower the essence. This syncs up with the whole ideology that you put a full essence in and you get a full essence out. So you can't put essence into a droid, use up the energy and then get that essence out because it hasn't been fully recharged. It doesn't cost essence to recharge the droids. That's just a process that at the moment happens through the mentor. Later in the ecosim, we will probably have certain recharging buildings that allows you to do that. Final option we have here is obviously the most exciting or the most rewarding one, and that is the raid button. When I press on the raid button, I'll be presented with an option to select which droids I want to send on a raid. This will present me with a, a number of different details from each droid on how far it can travel. Remember, relocating and raiding will have different ranges raiding takes up more energy you'll see that you'll have a much shorter range to raid another property as compared to relocating between two of your properties and mentors range will be a lot shorter but it will still present you with all the details about the various droids that are available for you to send on a raid so the first step you make here is to select which droids you want to raid with if you haven't raided any properties around the radius of this, of your property yet, you will have no history to select who to attack or who to, who to try and raid. In this case, you need to go onto the map and select the property that you want to raid. Once you've raided a property, you'll have the ability to keep that as a favorite list or as a recent list so you can re-raid it a lot easier in the future. It will also show you the properties within range for the droids that you've selected. In this case, you can see I'm sending one droid to raid Mushroom Island in Canberra, ACT Australia. This auto raid option is something I'll talk about a little bit later. Now, let's take a look at the new Insights system that we've built for raiding and droids. Insights is a useful tool that presents the player with raid-related statistics and trends that can prove vital when it comes to determining certain gameplay decisions and strategies. In the future, it is highly probable that Insights will be a valuable reference for other future E2 gameplay features as well, but for now, the focus will solely be around raiding. The Insights interface will be accessible via the Raid Management section. Insights will be an unlockable feature. At a later stage, in another video, I'll talk about how Insights can be unlocked for players. But for now, let's just talk about what Insights is and what it does. So Insights can be unlocked for both the property and its tethered droids. Upon selecting insights, the player will initially be presented with a list of properties that have unlocked this insights functionality. The player can also choose to view a list of the droids tethered on these properties, and once a property or droid is selected from the list, their unique raid-related insights will be made available to the player. First, Let's take a look at a droid's insights. 
A droid's insights will consist of five separate sections. There are the droid's power stats, performance history, success rate, properties that have rated, and a comparison against the player's highest performing droids. The first section is a brief overview of the droid's power stats. This includes the droid's speed, storage, energy efficiency, max raid distance, and max relocation distance. The potential of a droid's power stats relies heavily on the jewels slotted in them at this point in time. The top of this section will also display a single line of the droid's most recent activity for convenience. This may include its most recent raids, relocations, or upgrades. The second section is the droid's performance history, that is, a graphical display of the raids it has performed over time. The player can see how much ether each of the droid's raids resulted in, if any. If a player desires to only view a droid's successful raids over time, for example, raids that actually resulted in obtaining ether, they may do so by selecting the Successful Raids button above the graph. However, this will not be the only information available in this section. The player will also be able to view a droid's relocation and upgraded, downgraded history over time. This will be available as overlays throughout the graph depending on which buttons are selected or deselected. For instance, when relocation is selected, the graph will display when and where a droid has traveled when relocating between properties. The trend line will also turn green for whenever the droid was raiding for the property it is currently tethered to. When upgrades or downgrades is selected, the graph will display when, which, and by how much a droid's power stats were affected each time its jewels were reslotted. The third section will display a droid success rate. The success rate tells us how many of a droid's raids have successfully resulted in obtaining ether. For example, if a droid has a success rate of 12.5%, that means 12.5% of the droid's total raids have been successful and resulted in collecting ether. The actual amount of successful and total raids a droid has made will also be displayed above this percentage. Below this we can see the number of unique properties the droid has raided. For instance, this particular droid has successfully raided 25 unique properties 75 times. Further down is the raided ether the droid has obtained from their raids. As well as this, there will be two lines of data outlining the average ether obtained per raid and the average raids performed per day. The fourth section will display properties the droid has raided. Players can select whether they wish to view the properties they have raided the most or properties they have gained the most ether from via the filter in the top left corner. This information will be presented as a multi-layered interactable pie chart consisting of a central circle and two concentric rings. The size and value of each segment in the inner concentric ring will indicate how many times a property has been raided. In this case, it appears that the droid has raided Join My Megacity and Please Don't Raid Me the most out of all their rated properties. However, in order to make a proper assessment on whether this high raid frequency is actually worth the outcome, the player can then reference the outer concentric ring and determine how much ether was actually obtained from these raids. If we look at the example again, although Please Don't Raid Me seems to be pulling its weight, Join my megacity, despite having a significantly higher raid frequency, has not obtained nearly as much ether as Diamond Hands, who in return has a notably lower raid frequency. Finally, 
The centric circle will initially display the total ether rated by the droid within the specific time frame. However, this value may change depending on what segment is selected. For instance, if a segment from the inner ring is selected, the RAID frequency of said property will be displayed as a percentage of the total RAIDs committed. If a segment from the outer ring is selected, the ether rated from the selected property will be displayed as a percentage of the total ether rated. The player may also interact with the button bar above if they wish for the pie chart to display all the properties the droid has rated across its entire lifetime, or solely the properties it has rated whilst tethered to the current property. The final section will include a column graph comparing the player's best performing droids with the droid currently selected. The player will be able to alternate between viewing a graphical display of the droids who have collected the most ether and the droids with the highest success rate. There will be a max sample of 20 droids presented in these graphs positioned in descending order based on the values of their allocated rectangular bars. When ether is selected, then each rectangular bar will consist of the total ether collected by each droid. Similarly, if the success rate is selected, then each rectangular bar will depict the success rate of each droid. Towards the end of each graph will be the current droid the player is viewing. The player will therefore be able to compare the performance of their droids based on its total rated ether and success rate. Finally, let's take a look at what a property's individual insights would entail. A property's insights will consist of five different sections. The property insights overview a statistical comparison section, a graphical display of rated properties, a pie chart depicting the ether contribution of its tethered droids, and a graphical display of a property's raids. A properties overview will display seven different types of information, four of which will be displayed as a row of circular holders. The first holder will display the total ether a property's droid has rated, if we look at the interface, we can see that this particular property has rated a total of 15 Ether and its most recent successful rate resulted in 3 Ether. We can also see that this property has the 7th highest Ether yield out of the player's uh, total properties. The total number of droids tethered to a property will also be displayed in this section. If there are droids relocating to or from the property, the number of droids relocating will be displayed as a bracketed number below. A property's success rate, which as mentioned before, tells us how many raids have been successful in obtaining ether. It is apparent that 65% of the raids made by this property have been successful. However, the absence of a given rank indicates the success rate is not within the player's top 10 highest success rates. This may suggest that although the property has rated a substantial amount of ether, it was due to the quantity rather than the quality of the raids. The final circular display will present the total raids and number of unique properties rated by the property's tethered droids. Below this row will be two lines of data. The first line will depict the average ether obtained per raid and day. The second line will display the average raid frequency raid per day. Similarly to that of the droid section, a line of data depicting the property's most recent raid related activity will also be displayed within the insights segment. The second section of a property's insights is the statistical comparison. This is mainly an interactable line graph that illustrates the property's daily obtained ether or success rate over time. 
Players may select a comparative trend to display next to the ether or success rate trends in an attempt to identify a particular correlation between them. The comparative trends will consist of the total raids, successful raids, and actively raiding droids per day. Depending on the variables values present in the graph, the left and right axes will alter. Just remember that the right axes will always represent the data type of the comparative trends while the left axes will represent the ether or success rate over time depending on what is selected. It is also important to note that ether can be represented as a cumulative trend. This is a standalone trend so that players will not be given the option to compare it with the previously mentioned comparative data sets until it has been reverted back into single stats form. The third section includes a multi-bar graphical display of the properties rated by the droids tethered to the player's property. The main goal of this section is to allow the player to compare their rated properties against each other and determine how profitable each property is. Each property will consist of three groups of data. These are the number of times a property has been rated, the number of successful raids and the total ether obtained from said successful raids. The player will also be able to choose which properties are presented in this graph. For instance, if they desire to display the properties they have rated the most or the properties they have gained the most ether from, they may do so by selecting the drop down above. This section allows players to see just how useful a property's droids are by presenting how much ether obtained by each droid actually contributed to the property's total rated ether. The player will be able to select whether they wish to view this information as a pie chart or as a table. If we select a pie chart, we can see that each of its segments represents how much ether each droid has collected, while the central circle displays the total ether rated by all the property's droids. Please note that there will be a max amount of droids that can be displayed in this pie chart, so all the ether obtained by the droids with the lowest ether contribution will be combined as its own segment. This same information can also be displayed as a table consisting of three columns. The first being the droids, the second the ether contribution as a percentage, and the third being the actual value of ether contributed. If a player only wishes to view the ether rated by the droids currently tethered, they may do so by selecting the appropriate drop-down. The final section allows players to view all the raids they have from the selected property. They may choose to either view a multi-bar column graph of the most recent raids made to a specific property or all the raids made on a specific date. Hence, is unique in that it will hold two of these multi-bar column graphs simultaneously. The first graph will automatically display all the raids of the most recent raid day. The values on the horizontal axis will therefore hold all the locations raided on this date. Each location will consist of three groups of data. The ether obtained, the number of droids sent, and the number of competing droids encountered while raiding that target property. It is highly likely that players will use this section with a specified date and or property in mind. For instance, let's say that we see a sudden drop in rated ether via the statistical comparison graph. The player can then identify and input the date with which this drop occurred into the graph and view which properties had been targeted. The player may then discover a substantial amount of competing droids encountered while raiding these properties. It may then be wise to either target other less popular surrounding properties or 
relocate the property's droids to another location with potentially more ether yield. Now, let's do a quick run through on how the droid management section will function. As the title suggests, the droid management section will help you to micromanage your entire droid fleet, whether by accessing droids directly or filtering out particular droids on certain properties. To access this section, players will first have to select the raid management button, which will load a new page. Once in this page, the player can then select the droid management button in order to view and access all their droids. They can alternate between viewing a list of their droids or a list of their properties, which when selected will display the droids tethered to those properties. If we take a closer look, we can see that each listed droid will have four of its powered stats displayed. These are the droids speed, ether hold capacity, energy efficiency, and the number of joules that have been slotted into the droid. The date with which the droid has been built will also be displayed in the top right corner of the droid card, and this may be important over time. If the droid has been newly built, a new tag in place of the date will be displayed for a temporary period of time, allowing you to easily identify new droids that you've recently built. Upon selecting a droid, its general information will be displayed on the right-hand side of the list. The information presented in this section includes the droid's name, its location, its status, the number of jewels slotted on the droid, its rarity level, the storage, speed, energy efficiency, max relocation and raid distances, total raids, the success rate, the total ether obtained, and the total unique properties rated. The player is also able to do two minor things in this section. They can rename the droid and power or depower their power cells using essence. Although this section displays a lot of useful information about individual droids, the feature that will surely receive the most utilization is the dual slotting feature, which is accessible via selecting the dual slotting option next to droid info. Upon this selection, the list of droids will be replaced with the player's dual inventory, while the droid's info will simultaneously be replaced with the droid's slotting feature. The quality, quantity and combination of the jewels slotted into each droid can significantly improve the overall effectiveness of the droid's abilities during raid missions. These abilities are a droid speed, max ether hold capacity, max relocation and raiding travel range distances, and energy efficiency. The player simply needs to drag and drop the jewels from the inventory into each of the droid's jewel slots. Each time a jewel is slotted, its effects on the droid's power stats will be displayed in the results section below. Once a player is satisfied with the results, they can select the apply button to officially but not permanently confirm the slotting. If the player is unsatisfied with their slotting changes, they may alternatively select Cancel, which would subsequently undo all the unapplied slotting alterations they have made. So there you have it. You have a brief overview of how raiding and droids will be introduced into Earth 2, what it will look like, some idea about the long-term plan and how it will initially function. This clearly shows our willingness and attention to add utility to key platform commodities such as ether, essence and jewels, all of which come from owning and using virtual land inside of Earth 2. 
and all of which our proactive, supportive players have been diligently gathering and sometimes trading to date. One of our goals behind the rating concept was to provide gameplay mechanics, not only for super proactive players, but also for casual players who'd like an option to participate inside of Earth 2 while navigating their busy day-to-day -day lives. In my opinion, over time, this will actually create an interesting overlap between the hands-on immersive player inside E2v1 in the future and the casual player using less real-time reliant game mechanics such as trading in this regard. We're gradually building toward the first pre-alpha E2v1 access sometime in 2023 to initially focus on showing game mechanics such as raiding. So game mechanics like raiding would be viewable inside of E2v1 in real time. After we get that operational, one of our follow-up goals will be to support player avatars running around inside of E2v1 while game mechanics such as raiding are concurrently playing out in real time, creating, I guess, this kind of player-controlled and operated world that you not only view from a distance, but can jump into and interact up close and personal with. So, for example, Imagine droids being sent on a raid, but then as an avatar, you could grapple hook onto one of the droids or even try to bring one down. That's just one example, but think along the lines of things like that, where casual players are, are influencing gameplay that hands-on avatar players can also interact with. From there, we then add some gameplay to explore, loot, uh, PvE, and things really start to get interesting. It's already pretty addictive just running around and exploring E2v1 as it is so massive and expansive. So, I don't know, I just think that things will really start to get quite interesting at that point and once we hit that milestone. Now, when we release rating on the website, it will obviously be the first iteration. A first iteration you can already see is very detailed and robust and easy to defend against, but things will become harder and more riskier as players realize our long-term expansion plans for rating and droids inside of Earth 2. I'm referring to things like more direct P vs P uh, with like intercepting other players droids to steal ether, the ability to defend against such attacks and other interesting additions that I'm not going to reveal just yet. We will test the core base mechanics in this first iteration of raiding over the next few months and while balancing we'll start to add some of these bells and whistles and some of these extra fun parts to make things a little bit more interesting. And there are other changes coming too. So jewels are going to be harder to collect amongst many other things. So enjoy the good times when they last. For larger accounts which own a lot of properties, the first iteration of rating may prove too time consuming for you as one person. To Play across all of your properties will probably be quite difficult, so I suggest you use this initial time as a learning curve on how the mechanics will work. The release of civilians and then later player-to-player -player contracts, both of these things being things that the, the team will focus on implementing once the first iteration of raiding goes live, will definitely make the players life easier, especially those larger property owners, and they'll introduce direct collaboration for mutually agreeable benefits between contracted players. So just use the first iteration of rating to learn how it works, um, and then some of the other things that we will be releasing subsequently will assist in those larger property owners being able to maintain all of their properties with help of other players, with the help of other players.
So if you are a player who owns a lot of properties, maybe just use this time before contracts are released to at least build droids on all the properties you want to use for raiding so that they're ready to go for other players to control once the player to player contract system is released. As you would have learned through this video, there are many moving parts to the raiding and droid mechanics. And while this image does not cover all of those moving parts, the visualization of uh, droid's basic stats paints a detailed picture on how they can be used. So I thought it's worthwhile sharing this little image one of our concept artists put together. We have base stats like the droid weight, 100 kilograms in this example. Many droids are actually a little less than the size of a small car. You have the number of power cell sockets determining how many sockets the droid has power cells for to be loaded. You have the size of the power cell the droid can take, which also determines how much essence is required to charge that power cell and ultimately determines how long that power cell can last. You have the base relocation range, the basic starting range for a droid to relocate between networked mentors, that is. You have the range raid, the basic starting range that a droid can travel when launching into a raid. And a little fun fact, a one kilometer radius puts almost 9,000 tiles in range. So imagine how much this multiplies if you decide to strategize with the use of jewels to expand that droid raid radius. A little food for thought. There is also the storage bay determining how much total ether that droid can safely carry before needing to dispense. So that's another strategy. You might want to slot your jewels in a way that allows your droid to carry more ether, especially if you've found a very lucrative property to raid. You've got the top speed of the droid, which will probably become important for a multitude of reasons over time, and once again is, is uh, affected by the jewels that are slotted. You've got the number of jewels a droid can have slotted at one time. Uh, you've got the time that droid takes to discharge ether. Sometimes you might want that to happen a little bit faster, so there'll be various things you can do for that. Then there are performance stats based on the loaded power cell and other attributes, which tells you how much charge you have, how many minutes and how far a distance you have on your droid. You won't be able to send a droid to raid a property if it does not have enough charge for the return trip. So if your droid cannot make the return trip, you won't be able to send it to that property. However, if your droid leaves on one of these valid round trips, but wastes too much time on the property scanning, for example, maybe the ether wasn't available at the time you expected, and then it runs out of power, or it may have even collected the ether and be on the trip home and run out of power, the only way that droid can then return to the base is via the Mentor, which slowly pulls it back at a snail's pace. And when I say a snail's pace, I mean very, very slow, putting it out of action for a considerable amount of time. So this is another strategy. If you get too many of those, you'll have droids out there not working, coming back very, very slow. Um, and suddenly the strategy shifts to slotting jewels that might improve your speed and your efficiency. There are also things like work statuses and recharge specs. I mean, even with all the details I have covered in this lengthy video today, there are still elements and algorithms I've not even touched on. Systems that we're building in the back end to allow these front end experiences to function. I didn't even touch on like the drain model, for example, and many other similar systems which will have long term relevance for future game mechanics and systems that we've designed for, for raiding and for the ecosim, uh, for logistics and transportation and trading. But all of these will have to wait for another day. Just remember that there is a lot happening in the background to make all of this function in the front end for you guys. And yes, I mentioned earlier that I was going to share some stats on the initial indications about how many raid ready droids various property sizes will be able to support. 
So that should be up on the screen now. You'll note that initially the Mentars on tiny properties do not have the power to launch droids out to raid another property. Well, for now, I hope this was informative enough for the Earth 2 community who have been interested in how raiding will work. I thank you very much for your patience. Um, it, I think raiding was obviously or is obviously a little bit more complicated than what many people thought. And I hope all of this provides you guys with an idea about what my personal approach to game design looks like. So this is my direct involvement with the game design for Earth 2 and how I see it fitting with the overall vision and what myself and my new game design team has been able to turn around in a really short couple of months. We want to release game mechanics that are directly related to the long-term goals of Earth 2, the, the platform, specifically having direct and relevant use inside of our 3D planned Earth E2v1. Droids and Raiding is only part of what our new team has designed so far. There is still so much that you guys will see over coming months. And I'm not talking about civilians and player to player contracts alone, but also robust structured direction for the ecosim and so much more. And some hints of that will probably come out in the release of our new website. I have an amazing team around me who makes sense of my sometimes crazy ideas and direction and they actually improve on them and they just get things done which is so refreshing they are all doing such an outstanding job plus we now have the different phase dev design teams all working closer together than ever thanks again and i look forward to releasing details about civilians and player to player contracts soon and i'm especially looking forward to releasing footage of e2v1 showing some of the cool progress and how phase 2.5 is coming together until next time keep safe and i'll see you then